1. Wherever you are, this is a global event. And I'm Lorival Santana from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I have the pleasure of moderating this session between the Latin American expressions that has now become a tradition of the Atlantic Dialogues. And this is the sixth year in a row that we do this session. So we're going to speak about global matters and regional matters. And we talk about each country and each society. These are universal topics that have to do with our experience with the pandemic and also the polarization and politics. And the different ideological and political webs, waves that go through our continents and the meaning that we'll have for our countries. To do so, we have the former president, Hamil Mawar, from Ecuador. He was the president between August 1998 and January 2000. Mawar is called at the John F. Kennedy Harvard University Government School, where he now teaches in the executive education program. He teaches negotiation. And he recently published a very successful book. About regularizing Ecuador. He's been a bestseller in Ecuador for a few months. And we also have Mr. Federico Ramon Puerta. He has been a senator, governor, deputy, a member of parliament, and ambassador of Argentina in Madrid. He is a Peronism leader and rural entrepreneur. He is involved with Republican Peronism, a movement in Argentina, part of the Opposition Alliance. And they were successful in the last parliamentary elections. Mr. Mawad lives in Cambridge, near Boston, and Ms. Ramon Puerta lives in Apostoles de las Misiones, the Mate capital in Argentina, in the northwest, close to the country, with my, close to the border with my country, Brazil. We also have Miguel Angel Rodriguez Echeterria. He was a Congress member, a Minister of Planning, Director of the Central Bank, and President of Costa Rica between 1998 and the year 2002. General Secretary of the Latin um, of the American States Organization. He is an economist and lawyer with a PhD by the University of California, Berkeley. And he's now a commentator and writer on economical, legal, and political topics. And he speaks from San Jose in Costa Rica. Unfortunately, we will not have Mr. Jorge Tuto Quiroga, the former president of Bolivia. He had to change his travel plans, and he's right now flying from Uruguay to the USA. So I'm sure that in the near future, with 5G, there will not be a problem anymore, and we'll be able to establish these connections from a plane. So for today, we have the three former presidents of Argentina, Ecuador, and Costa Rica. So let's begin speaking about the global context that has changed quite a bit since our last conversation a year ago with the victory of Joe Biden in the USA, which brought about the topic of the environment and climate change, and also democracy and human rights to the top of his political agenda and the international relations, as well as the tensions between the USA, China, and Russia that have increased even more, even with the troops concentrated in the border with, you, with Ukraine. So let's begin with you, Mr. Jamil Mawar. How do you see the global situation in these year 2021, 
And what do you think the world has in store for our region? Thank you, Laurival. It's a pleasure to be here with you once again with our express and friends. And I think we have experienced a transition. Some of us are older than others, and we might remember the times of the Cold War, where we had a bipolar world. On the one hand, Russia as the governing a part of the world, and the USA governing another part. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, some people thought that we were getting to a one polar world that only lasted for a few years. But I think now we're living a clearly example of multipolarity. We have the three large countries you mentioned, as well as the European Union, and there is a play of balance to see who prevails over what. And the big novelty in the last two or three decades has been the situation in China. This is a new stakeholder with great strength, with a very clear and great strategy and that they announced publicly. So they want to show some sort of global hegemony, politically and economically. They also think that since they had great times in the past, China in the region, they think it's time for that to be repeated and consolidated. And based on their historical perception, mainly with the Marxism and Leninism, they think they're in the right time. They see that the North American world is declining, theirs is rising, their own Chinese system is rising, so it's the time for a confrontation that does not need to be a war confrontation, but somehow due to the history laws or the history inertia, it's their time to succeed. So they're based in, they base themselves in facts, in great economic results, in three decades growing at between three and seven percent. They have tried to source many industries in the world. They have a great economic role. They have given a big part of the cake to North American bar, banks who finance projects with the Chinese Communist Party, and these are very intelligent strategy that is rendering great results. And since their partners are General Electric, Apple and Tesla, is some sort of society and global coordination that is totally different. Maybe this is the biggest Trojan horse that humanity has, has known. And I think I'll finish here, but that has lain to some sort of blindness. The fact that a capitalistic idea or system could not work in a country with a communist party. And those ideas that have been repeated on end have been validated by practice and reality. is working well with excellent results. And then in the second round, we'll see the implications for Latin America of that situation. Thank you, Mr. Mawad. And please mute yourselves if you're not speaking. Mr. Rodriguez, you're in Costa Rica, close to the USA and the, and the Chinese confrontation that has affected security portfolios and value chains, as well as the interests of the USA to get isolated. It's a strong word about when we speak about China, but it has increased the scope and the space of China and their economic reach in the world. How do you see that dispute, Mr. Rodriguez? Thank you. Thank you, Laurival, and I greet all the former presidents and yourself, the organizers, and everyone who is seeing us today. Jamil mentioned the major lines of the world we're living in, in current geopolitics. Those geopolitics affect different regions according to their own features. And you're mentioning the value chains. 
So for Latin America, or Central America, that could be an advantage. The fact that the pandemic, the confrontation between China and the USA, and the logistic problems that we are experiencing right now in shipments that generate the interest from multinational companies. Even having the supply sources and exchanges closer in value chains. In Costa Rica, there's an advantage. In the last 30 years, we've had a great increase in our exports basket. And 30 or 40 years ago, we were already exporting coffee, banana, sugar. That represented 70% of exports 30 years ago, but right now, they don't represent even 10% of our exports. We export many things, many countries, and we have an important external footprint that has kept throughout the years, and during the pandemic, the export sector in the free port areas decreased for a couple of months, but it's kept growing at levels of about 20% more per year, year on year. So that sector has really become more dynamic. But the situation is not the same in, all, in the whole region. Central America has a clear division. We have the Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, with the large migration towards the USA there, and with very complex and weak governments. And that different from the Sikh organization where we have the Dominican Republic, Panama, and Costa Rica, with more democratic, stable, and calm governments. ECR also to invest. Panama and the Dominican Republic are two of the Latin American countries that have grown the faster, for better or for worse, in the last few decades. Not so much Costa Rica as those other two countries, but the growth has kept despite the important tax difficulties that we have faced in the last 12 years. And that have been put it out appropriately, but have been aggravated by the pandemic. So the program is out there. The results will be better this year. And the growth will also be higher than what thought initially, and higher than expected by the Central Bank Review in October last year. So the route is fragile, and important measures need to be taken. And that leads to an important situation. I think the world, as we were saying, and as our colleague Jamil was saying, there are different traps of countries that feel that another player is coming to take their prevalence and they become very aggressive. And also the trap of the arising country that sees that another country will not let them emerge and they become aggressive towards those countries. So Central America, as we we're mentioning, experience that also in the situation of large migrations, and that's our weakness and our strength. If we can avail of this to get organized properly in the face of the government of the Biden press, of President Biden and Mexico and the Asian interests, who are, interest, who are interested in having stability in this area, and that stability is endangered right now due to the circumstances of the countries and the clear example and the clear problem with what happened in Nicaragua, where President Ortega and Murillo, his wife, jailed seven of the most important opposition leaders and more than 30 diverse leaders, and they led to elections that were not really valid. So Nicaragua, 
began establishing a direct relationship with countries in a similar situation, such as Venezuela and Cuba. And, part, and their countries are supporting these countries, and that really divides Latin America. The big challenge for Latin American integration comes from 1961, really, when the Punta Leste Charter was signed in 1961, and conversations began about a Latin American alliance for free trade. Nearly 60 years ago, that was reaffirmed in the Montevideo and Punta del Este meeting in the presidential summit in 1967. I was a young minister back then with Mr. Jose Joaquin Treos, and then in the Miami summit in 1994, there was an integration for this to be a a commercial alliance with the USA. And then it became diluted and it led to a circumstance where Latin America has not been able to find a way to integrate in economic matters in such a way that advantage could be taken from the relationships between the members. We have different groups, the common Latin American market, Mercosur, and Comer with the Caribbean, the Pacific Alliance, different integration levels in the north. We have the new NAFTA version with Canada. And in a world where the Russia-USA confrontation broke the commercial order based on the WTO rules, and that leads to a much more complex world, commercially speaking. That is still globalized. It keeps depending on, depending on value chains but it doesn't have the security of conflict resolution mechanisms to reach agreements that were hoped for in, in the WTO in the former decades. So it's a, these are very difficult times indeed. If we add to that, and I do apologize for extending on this, but if we add to this, that we're experiencing times when with the Berlin Wall fall and the Soviet Union disintegration, we looked like we were getting into a world with a consensus of democracy, rule of law, commercial exchanges, and free markets. Then we went to the opposite, and which was a lack of prestige of all those institutions, the populism in the right and the left, and the circumstances where we lived a democracy that loses its liberal features a democracy that does not take care of the rule of law and there are stronger confrontations with groups with different interests making it difficult to get national perspectives joining interests for a common good with parties with different visions and perspectives integrating the interests of different groups so the countries are more fragmented, and the social media promote this as well. And the tech change is also changing the way in which we live very quickly, quicker than what our mind may adapt to. So that's the world we're living. That's what's coming, and will not be easy to learn to live in that world. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. You mentioned some points that will dealing further. But Ramon, I'd like to speak about how that dispute between the USA on the one hand and on the other hand, Russia and China has become more visible in Argentina. In the projects we have for China with satellite parks and surveillance and monitoring in Patagonia, Although centuries of China, Argentina and Russia is trying to do similar things, and the USA is trying to keep their influence on Argentina. Oh, and could you please unmute yourself? We cannot hear you right now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, thank you. So my perspective is that back in 1989, 1990, 
with the fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall, that unipolar single world that was believed did not actually happen on many grounds, but it did happen in the economy. So there's only one single economic model that is progressing faster or more slowly, but that is a capitalistic model, liberal and with privatizations led by China, Vietnam, the USA, Europe, and other countries in our continent. The other model, where they say it was the owner of the companies, where private property was strongly questioned, where the free trade was not well regarded upon, that fell. And the current government in my country, like the Cuban and Venezuelan government, economically wouldn't look at them. There are other things that could be debated, but financially, economically, that single model and that China that fully enrolled very efficiently on a path where the USA and Europe do not have the same efficiency. But what gives me peace of mind? That there is an interaction, a match of interests very strong between large American companies and China. So it's very difficult to know how far a Chinese economic decision is not a USA economic decision or from a USA company or entrepreneur, or from an efficiency model that is shared. So I'll leave out the, I'll leave Russia out, because they fight hard, particularly in Europe, and we have the Ukrainian topic as an example. But in my country, the Chinese presence is important, and it's an example of what I mentioned, but what does China have economic efficiencies in the fact that the political model is only one. I do like democracy and press freedom, and I want more freedoms than the economic freedom. So I do not like the Chinese model because you cannot be in the opposition. You cannot think differently. Look at what happened in the politicians in Hong Kong. They got used to a free regime, and currently, no lawmaker is in the opposition. So the political economic, the political model is one thing, the economic model is another thing. But the economic success is a determining factor. Without that, we cannot do the rest of things. And that's the flaw of Russia. So Russia has that weakness that China does not have. China enter an economic deficiency model that I've only seen in Vietnam, seeing how a country develops and carries out policies that can also be seen other places in Asia, such as Japan or Singapore. But the challenge now is how to guarantee the democratic freedoms as well as other freedoms. And the pandemic is now showing the weakness with very rigid quarantine policies, coercion different articles regarding the freedom to travel and a doctor with a good journalist can do terrorism with a virus that exists, that is a big problem. But we do need to find compatible models where the economy does not fall for these reasons. So I do think that there is a big challenge. And things here come after the economic success. So how do we guarantee that that economic success is not the basis for many detectorships? And it leads to losing quality of life and freedom. So that's a big challenge, a big question mark. And I think from the political side, there are many things to do. So polit politi politicians are not well regarded in Japan. In my region, they want to keep politicians out. So can we, how can we have the democracy without political parties? And how can we have political parties without politicians? Because marketing is not enough. That is enough for, to get to the government, but not to do politics. So politics 
need us to is to separate the wheat from the straw, the wheat from the chaff, and we need to guarantee things that can only be guaranteed if there is an, a strong ethical, moral, libertarian commitment with internal discussions. And a democracy without parties cannot exist. And political parties without politicians cannot exist either. Thank you so much, Ramon. Well, the pandemic and the fact that climate change has become even more important geopolitically, all that takes us even more to the same page to Latin American countries. We have had similar problems regarding the lack of vaccines and we didn't develop our own vaccines and we also have weaknesses in our health systems and we have poor populations that can not have savings to stop working. So they're at home, so then they cannot go home and get protected. We have forests, some of us are Amazonian countries, but not all, but we do have spaces for sustainable development and to sell carbon credits. So there are many topics where we are on the same page. But then the polarization that dominates our societies is also polluting the relationships between our countries. Let me give you an example. President Jair Bolsonaro in my country, in Brazil, has not yet congratulated the elect president of Chile, Gabriel Borch, because he's left wing. And same thing with Argentina, with Alberto Fernandez, and with Bolivia. So, Mr. Manuel, could you please comment on this? How do you see the matter of ideolo ideological polarizations and how are the minds relations between countries? We could help each other further, but we only speak when we are on the same ideological wing. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, to round up the matter of China and Latin America, and include my answer in that framework, it's really amazing to see this project that, has, that was born eight years ago. It was planned for a decade and translated into Spanish. It could be called A Belt and a Path, which is a Chinese project to invest thousands of thousands of millions of dollars in more than 70 countries in several continents to meet the demands of those countries for projects they consider important for the development. That is advancing of giant steps. In those contexts, the project may begin from scratch and China may offer everything, may offer the design, initial capital, the project management, the market for products and so on. They may buy a company, an ailing company, and apply all the good management mechanisms for that to change. And that means that the debt of our countries increases alarm, alarmingly. And in that way, China ensures a repayment because our dependency increases quite quickly. So what's the advantage? Well, when there's a need, there's a helping hand saying, well, here's what you need, please use it. And in my mind, it's like what happened in Latin America in the 50s after the Second World War. When the USA had that role, and there's a law in physics, and if you leave a, an empty space, someone will occupy it. And since, as a continent, we virtually disappeared of the radar of American priorities, there was such a big void there that is now being taken by China. And I do not see anything there that the Western world has to offer comparable to these perfectly devised and financed strategies 
with a future horizon that China has. In that circumstances, in those circumstances, we get the pandemic. And how does that leave us? Assuming that it may have left us, even though in reality it is still damaging us. In the last ASAPAL report, I was shocked by what we, what I call 8, 20, 30, 8% of the global population is Latin America, 20% of the people affected, and 30% of COVID casualties are also in Latin America. So we were the region in the world that was managed this topic from the public health perspective. And of course, we have many differences, a large differences between the countries is just the average. So we were left poorer, more unequal, and more vulnerable. And it was clearly established that we need a public health system, the way of providing it, then that could be up to, to debate, but we do need it. We have lost million children that have stopped going to schools. Some of them, some of them might never go back because the learning cycle has been cut off. And besides, we are deeply frustrated with resentment towards the political system within which this happened, which in our continent we call democracy, quote unquote. And I'm talking about two reliable data sources, ASEPAL and the Latin Barometer, establishing that the backing of democracy in classical terms is at some of the lowest levels in history. Because people want solutions and people have the feeling that the solutions offered by democracy were not the ones I expected. That could be a wrong appreciation, maybe a bit short-sighted, but that's what people feel. People vote for what they feel. So what's coming in the future from that situation? If we had to choose from a world where regional integration is promoted as a priority or a world in which the alliance of a country is promoted as a great global power, I have the feeling and that alliance that we could call vertical could have priority on the horizontal alliance between countries. So we do not need to necessarily choose one or the other. I think they're perfectly compatible. But as well advances, I see that the so-called vertical integration will have some priority. Secondly, we'll have a much better breeding ground for populism. Populism worked in our continent and all over the world when the right social and economic circumstances are there. Poverty, satisfaction, anger. When someone comes and explains complex symbols in very simplistic and fake ways, but are attractive for the ears and the eyes of the voters, when those formulas are embodied by charismatic leaders that are very well good communicators. And as it happened in the first decade of the 21st century, they have all the money because the commodity price is sold and they can test with money that they, what they say, they can prove with money that what they say is correct. So you are poor because someone is stealing from you to reveal to the towards the robbers, I do love you, the other people didn't, and to sh prove it, here's this subsidy A, B, and C. Popul populists have always done that. And why didn't that work in the first decade of the 21st century? Because the populists had money that pretty much fell from the sky. There were big circumstances in the world that led to that, and I think we're going in that direction. Unfortunately, in a more populistic world, more polarized, we need to be very attentive because there could be very bad news for all countries and for the whole continent at large. Thank you, Mawad. Rodriguez, Mr. Rodriguez, Mawad mentioned what you said before regarding the value chains and the opportunities. And Mauricio Clave Carone, the president 
of the Inter-American Development Bank spoke about that, about the possibility that the cause of value chains coming from the East to the West could change, to have them going from the South to the North. And in that case, we could fit. So do you think that that opportunity, as many others, do you think we're going to lose again the train of history? Do you think we could avail of that? I'd like to speak about this and also about how polarization and ideology has polluted the relations between the countries. Thank you, Lord Rival. Speaking about the first topic, I think we need to understand that Latin America is a very diverse continent. The size of Brazil compared to the physical size of Salvador, or the population of Brazil in comparison to the population of Uruguay, without taking into account Caribbean states. If we did, the differences would be even bigger. And that means that our continent has very different economic development levels. Haiti, Nicaragua, and Honduras, in comparison to Chile and Uruguay, or Panama, are very different. They're diverse worlds. And besides, the geographical locations and their economic realities, are very different in the Caribbean, in Central America, and in South America. In South America, the commodity exports dominate, where China is a big player right now, and relations are increasingly more important with China than with the North. Central America, however, still has dependency on international relations, mainly with the USA and Canada, with Europe. So there are very big differences. And nearshoring is our ability to get value chains and links to get established in closer regional areas, where the logistic possibilities and the supply possibilities are better and where political problems are lower. And I think there's something very important for Central America and the Caribbean, and also for Mexico, maybe also for Colombia. In Northern South America. However, the attraction in a big part of Latin America will be the exports towards China. It could be important. President Mawar was saying that in this compatible element, we could understand each other in Latin American countries, in the Caribbean. We could integrate further commercially. We've been trying to do that for the last 60 years with limited success, except for sub-regions, that they had a biggest advancement. And this will have a secondary role in comparison to the verticalization of those relations. And in other Latin American regions also with the USA and Canada. So I do think that unfortunately, the confrontation between the USA and China that has weakened the WTO, something that took so much to build, beginning with the GATT ideas to create a WTO that had been suggested in Cuba in the 40s and that couldn't forge ahead, and that led to the WTO. That gives us the advantage of having global rules for trade with systems for dispute resolutions between countries that lead to legal resolutions that may be manageable and civilized instead of confrontation of powers. So that has changed radically after the confrontation of President Trump with China 
and it hasn't changed with President Biden. In the WTO, the USA hasn't yet appointed their representatives for conflict resolution bodies, so they are not integrated. And we are still in a situation where normal trade has been greatly weakened. And that's very serious, mainly for mid and small sized countries. Brazil and Mexico have very specific weight, which is large. There are strong markets, they can fight more. With the economic power struggle, Colombia has 10 times more inhabitants than Costa Rica, but Colombia has less probabilities than doing anything in that field. So we need to find how to go back to more normal and regulated relations between us. But to do that, we need to get together. We need to be joined. And confrontation between the states has become very difficult. And in societies with very specific interests groups, the parties with workers, entrepreneurs, rural inhabitants, urban inhabitants, people interested in cultural matters that get together in, in large countries. And Costa Rica is now going to elections with 25 presidential candidates. And this is just reflecting the inability that we have to join the different sector interests in national interests. And those difficulties are stated by Latin Barometer. All the other international democracy measurements show that in the world, just like in Latin America, democracy has lost prestige as well as the rule of law. And there is more interest in governments that may impose a solution, even though they may not respect the rules of the of the rule of law, the division of powers, the freedom of press and expression, individual liberties, and that is weakening us. And I think that there is a rebirthing of values. And in the centuries after the Renaissance, we built those values in the Western world, values around solidarity and freedom, and that's essential to face the challenges we are now living are very serious challenges. The nuclear challenge is still alive with possibilities of becoming more serious and dangerous with the lack of solutions to situations such as Iran. We also have climate change. As we saw in Glasgow, we do not have the uh, ability to agree. And no matter how good is the willingness of Mr. Biden, he has not achieved to obtain regulatory support in the USA to go in that direction effectively. And that really weakens the possibility of getting international agreements. So we do have a very serious problem with migrations that will become more serious if inequalities keep increasing. And climate difficulties mean that some areas in the world become more difficult for people to live in. For example, Central America and the Caribbean with rising sea levels in island states. And we have very serious problems regarding technology. With artificial intelligence and changes in neuroscience, and maybe few people will be able to dominate us with algorithms. And liberties might decrease a lot. So the proportion of income going to workers has gone down in the whole world. And inequalities become more difficult. So we do have great challenges ahead of us. And I think we need to go back to our values and to try to get together as Latin Americans because those big differences allow the union to be very productive and so that we can make the most of these differences in our relations. And I think we cannot forget that only 
with relations with great powers will be able to solve the production problems to improve the living and poverty conditions of our inhabitants. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Ramon, Rodriguez had talked about normalizing relationships. This applies to interpersonal relationships and also those between political leaders and between countries. We are just coming out from the Mercosur summit between Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay and Uruguay did not even take part of it for the first time ever and did not sign the final communication. And why? Well, because Uruguay wanted to have the permission to negotiate the tax and customs tax with China and uh, the common external uh, customs tax, which is a common practice, and um, not even Brazil supported Uruguay on that point because they didn't want the Mercosur to uh, crack and to be uh, broken into pieces. How do you see the possibility of having certain or better relationship between the different countries? Don't forget to switch your mic on, Ramon. Ramon, we cannot hear you. Your microphone. The microphone. Your microphone is off. We apologize, we cannot hear any of the speakers right now. Ramon, we can't hear you. You, ha you have been switching on and off your mic, but it's still off. Yes, keep it there. You switched it off again. No. No. Yeah, there you have it. We seem to be having some technical issues with Ramon. Well, I will now ask our IT team to speak and deal directly with Ramon so he can switch on his mic. He might need to leave the Zoom meeting and come back in again. So we're going to move on to Jamil Mawad, and then we'll go back to Ramon then. Mawad. The normalization of relationships. Sitting around table to negotiate. This is necessary before accepting the different positions and hearing each other's positions. Are we heading that way? Or are we still going round in circles and not listening to each other? Is this going to last a long time, my word? Thank you, Lurival. It occurs to me that what happened to Ramon's microphone is an indication of what sometimes happens in the continent. We do not manage to hear each other. We make some efforts, but the voice did not, does not get to. I have the impression that he's now connected, if that's the case. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Ramon. We can hear you. That's a good sign, definitely. I think my internet connection dropped. Well, quickly, Mercosur has um, a cohabitants problems. You mentioned the case of Argentina and Brazil of Uruguay, of China, but between Argentina and Brazil, there are two presidents who not stand each other. And we need to understand that the mechanisms for integrations are absolutely paramount to be able to manage the most important things. It is very cold, what I'm going to say, but if you don't have um, economic success, everything will be very much uh, complicated. China's position gives it the resources to manage the economy of 32 countries in Africa, the presidents of the WHO, 
this man was a minister of health of Ethiopia. He's not a doctor and he won the elections. And why was this? Because China actually supported his uh, candidacy and who everybody thought would be the president was uh, set aside. And talking about the pandemic, this shows an economic deterioration across the planet. It might not be due to China. I stands, the um, country's economic model uh, actually stands for its, its transparency, but it is urgent. Uh, we understand that all health-related policies must be compatible with economy. This is the challenge for our scientists in health and in economy. My own president, uh, the president of Argentina, said it's either health or economy, and he went for life. And people uh, actually were uh, quite happy about it, but 20% of the people actually were affected by COVID, and uh, people died because the health system actually failed. We cannot uh, aid those people with a cancer problem, with a heart, condition we want to make democracy work when the economy is not working and what we did was to go back i don't know any authoritarian countries except the cases that i just mentioned china vietnam but on our continent i don't know any such cases of countries with an authoritarian regime where the economy is working fine we need as strong an integration as possible and one of the advantages of integration is that the smallest countries are the easiest one to agree to and with. And I remember back in time, people used to say to, to me, how can we compete? How can we be part together with Brazil or Argentina? We are such a small country. And I used to say to them, it's you who's going to win out because you're only small, you're more flexible. And whoever, and, and those who don't have a lot to win are bigger countries such as Brazil. When you get just a little bit and you're small, it looks like a lot. So integration models are absolutely fundamental. Political cohabitance actually allows for understanding and the economic uh, variable to make progress. I think Mercosur has different mistakes. The incorporation of Venezuela, it makes no sense whatsoever. When we were just uh, four countries, we used to make uh, progress by copying some things from, some good things from the European Union and correcting some uh, bureaucratic uh, defects from such an organization. So in economy, either you adjust or everything goes out of the window. And uh, we need to work for adjustments so we don't lose track. And once you do, once you lose track is when you start spending more than, you, than what you earn. So everything can be done if it's done properly. And uh, the consequences are dangerous if we are not doing the right thing. And I am worried because I see that many things are being done wrong. And the political model behind it uh, is not really satisfactory, if you ask me. Why is this country like China making progress? Because every year they incorporate 50 million people uh, or among the poorest and they make them richer and back then in my country in the 1990s we had a, a high numbers of poverty now we are at 46 percent i left my province a governor in my province there was only 16 percent when you have half of the people in your country being poor being a migrant country instead of a host country, we are doing something wrong. And what, where are the effects of this in the economy? When you are doing wrong in economy, there is no political alternative that can put it right. When you are doing things right, you need to be able to make use of those things. And as the former speakers said, there were some decades in the, third, in the, in the early years of the third millennium where we had some good uh, input. And we fail to use this to reinforce our efficiency, to become more productive and to improve our quality of life. We were the pioneers of what here we call the poverty model. There is a political model that goes beyond populism because populism is somehow a kind of a demagogy. And uh, 
just a few days ago, the president of the Spanish Partido Popular, Mr. Casado, you said you are, I said to him, you criticize populism and your country is the call, your party is called the popular party. So you need to talk about demagogy and this is the first step to get to the situation where we got in Argentina, the, that poverty model. And this is wonderful for the uh, people in power because with just a few cents and without jobs, you can stand and stay in a certain latency, sometimes just uh, being poor, but you don't work. And there is a discourse that try to get, uh, get people to act. The poverty model is a model of equality, but instead of going up, you're going down. You become more and more poor. I don't want to take any more time, but I just wanted to convey this idea in order to complement some very important thoughts that my uh, colleagues have just mentioned. And I would like to join the comments, their positions, and I believe that such uh, uh, this, uh, like, like a David, like, like this, is very important for our continent in seeking our way out. Very well, okay. I think we're going to have the last round of questions before I ask you some guided questions, uh, the questions that we've received from the audience. But Ramon has uh, led very well the last topic or block in this chat. We talk about how there is a kind of a wave of the left wing in Latin America uh, with uh, Samara Castro in Honduras, we have Luis Arce in Bolivia, Pedro Castillo in Peru, and now Gabriel Bolici also in, Ch in Chile. However, Ecuador has a different situation. They selected a super minister of Mr. Mawad's, uh, Guillermo Lasso. He is a businessman, he is a banker, and a conservative Catholic person. So he managed to defeat Rafael Correa's candidate, uh, who is the uh, great populist uh, who is um, exiliated in Belgium, accused of uh, receiving uh, funds from Aldebest, a uh, building company from Brazil. And also in Uruguay, we have Luis Lacajapo and... Um, but there are certain trends in Brazil and survey seem to be favoring Mr. Nasso, who is a left-wing leader. And also in Colombia, there seems to be a trend to go for a left-wing president. Mawad, are we clashing, or maybe not clashing, but are we witnessing a wave of the left-wing or not? I believe this will be the main issue for many years to come. And before, we already talked about this whether they were red or pink, whether they are going, they were going towards the uh, right or towards the left, it is part of the way we are. And I don't know whether that means that we are changing our opinion, uh, but maybe we are just trying one way and the other. And that is bad for a country that aims to develop. The countries with the best results and I think Chile and Costa Rica are good role models in Latin America, gave us a very clear lesson for their fellow uh, countries without looking elsewhere. And that's the fact that consistency does pay off. If you keep the same policies, you end up having good results. So I believe that indeed the elections are actually pointing at what Lurival just mentioned. How permanent is this going to be? I would like to mention two things here. First, we used to hear about liberal democracies, the typical division of powers, the legitimacy of the origin because they're directly chosen, the legitimacy of their exercise because there is a constitution and a series of laws, and also the legitimization of the results because they are improving the population's um, quality of life. Then Mr. Farid Zakaria created the concept of liberal democracies, meaning that they are chosen, they are legitimate in their origin, but the way they govern, they rule, uh, is no longer democratic. They abuse, they do not observe the legislation, etc. But now we are witnessing a third stage in some of our countries, and that's the narco states. 
So democracy is no longer a democracy of origin because they just play about with the elections, as Miguel Ángel described in the case of Nicaragua, which is shameful. The same goes to Venezuela. And they are not ashamed of calling that a democratic system. If a government from a country uh, prefers to look elsewhere and turn their back to the situation when there is a, a drug trafficking problem, this is bad enough for a country. But when the system of drug traffickers manage to capture the political power of a country, that political power is an actor of the system. And this is what we've witnessed in some countries already. And there is a risk that this will come even more later. So my concern is not that within the democratic playground, we can have a more uh, left or right prone government. The, at the end of the day, that is a democratic idea. People can have different opinions. They can vote to this, to that. But when there is no longer the possibility to vote, when the rules of the game are no longer the same and they are captured and kidnapped by government that continue to um, hold on to the power and don't, don't want to um, lose that power because they believe that they have the only truth, they represent the justice, they represent the people and the others are not important and that's where they hold on and there is no way of democracy with them. That is highly concerning. And then there is a second element. We need to stay uh, stray um, away and to steer clear of the uh, false dilemmas. Ramon talked about one of them, whether uh, virus or economy. This is a false dilemma. We don't need to choose either or. They can't go habit eradicating poverty or reducing inequalities. This is another false dilemma. You have to go for both. You have to balance both measures to have both results. Freedom. Some years ago, a from published an extraordinary book called The Fear to Liberty. And he distinguished two types of free liberties, of freedoms. The liberty to, uh, meaning that uh, there is no external exterior um, force that limits my capacity to move freely, and the liberty to do something, the liberty to develop my own individual capacities. So I see a uh, great insistence of liberty of what Martin Say and other authors call negative freedom. Nobody should uh, get into my business. That's fine. But if uh, you adore uh, that kind of criticism, uh, this extreme liberty, and you don't give a large portion of the population their capacities to exert their own freedom to improve their lives to be part of the whole thing then something is not working uh, so working on my own without being uh, without any uh, actions that is good but let's try to not fall into these false dilemmas Mr. Rodriguez, I would like to add an aspect to, the, to this discussion, and that's the fact that back in 2018, in the elections in your country, Costa Rica, there was a debate around the issue of uh, the um, same-sex union. And this had an influence in, on the results of the uh, elections. Mr. Alvarado, the one that was uh, chosen because both were called Alvarado, said he was in favor of that right which had just been uh, guaranteed by the Costa Rican Supreme Court. Now his mandate is coming to an end. You will have elections, I think, around February next year. How has your government evolved? A government that started under that uh, moral or cultural questions that uh, contaminated uh, political discussions or had such a, a direct influence on uh, political dialogues and uh, debates and it contributed to the uh, different uh, uh, positions with regard to cultural and moral uh, issues in your country. What can you tell us about the most global aspect of this, please? Thank you, Lurival. Yes, indeed, the elections were resolved between two candidates who just a month before the elections had only 50 five to six percent in terms of intention of vote each because each of them uh, uh, got hold of a cultural or value-based issue on totally opposing positions 
and the parties that had uh, uh, that were working more on economic or social issues or legal issues did not enter that uh, confrontation that clash uh, between two extremes and they left that fight and they only ended up with two candidates who before did not seem to have any possibilities so they went into the second round and this shows what i pointed out earlier one of the most serious problems is that division of interest the political parties that come uh, with democracy as a way of uh, reaching out to the people and uh, help them take uh, positions based on different interests to have a majority become groups that represent uh, highly technical things or highly sectorial elements and this makes uh, decision making difficult and this is a problem that gets increased with uh, social media that simplify and uh, make it even easier to conform such interest groups before doing this was very uh, costly so it didn't work uh, you needed a larger group but this technological shift that has this impact which i particularly find uh, how the growth of inequalities the communication of what's going on elsewhere makes the confrontation hatred and jealousy uh, much uh, stronger forces when it comes to taking uh, political decisions even more so than solidarity or the search for common ground and this has gotten us to this uh, situation costa rica has a government that came out well we actually had the advantage that the moderate uh, uh, parties supported both of them and they were able to model a program that was more moderate and costa rica has managed to deal with a tax related problem that had not been attended to properly by previous governments and this has been positive but the government is finishing its mandate with bad public opinion in my own view it's a little bit unjust but this is related to the fact that they turned the back to some of the issues and uh, they however started working with this uh, or around this uh, fiscal issue and we are hopeful in that we will see better results but i would like to focus for a moment on something that uh, i think is important jamil talked about how people go to one side and to the other if we look back at the history of Latin America, we realize that the region did not manage to converge with the uh, developed economies, not because it didn't have any growth periods, but rather because those growth periods were really short. We don't have stability in policies that allow you, allows you to have a longer uh, growth moment. And that makes us grow and fall, grow and fall. And this is, well, I studied business and some uh, farmers in the times where, when the times were good, they used to give their animals a lot of fodder to make them grow. And then they had uh, nothing after that. And I think that this is something that's really happening in Latin America. And I think that this is the response to something more important and that's the fact that we need to resolve the economic issue if we fail to do this we will not be able to give satisfaction to the people with uh, through their democracies and the credibility of a result as uh, president mawad mentioned will mean nothing people will be against democracy and they will not accept uh, that kind of democracy and they will accept a leader that uh, tells them what they want to hear they uh, will invent the limits of the uh, regime and people may fall into this uh, because they are frustrated and this what it means is that we need to go back to that balance the balance between different things and try and keep to the agreement if Lula and Petro win in Brazil and Argentina 87% in Pedro in Colombia yes Colombia and Brazil sorry 87 
75% of Latin Americans will have left-wing governments. That's no problem. You just look at Uruguay and how they grew with a left-wing government. This does not mean that it is contrary to the possibility of growth, but it will. this will depend on what kind of on whether the government will understand the advantages of investing, of productivity, and something that has not been mentioned that I would like to mention here. The challenge, as far as I'm concerned, the most serious challenge that Latin America is witnessing with the pandemic is that of education. The education system in Latin America with the lack of face-to-face um, -face, uh, classes, the lack of connectivity of students and teachers alike in many of the countries. This is going to uh, have a very negative impact. It will lead to a communication um, gap and students will lose one and a half years or more in the last two to three years because of the problems in the education capacity. This will mean that we will have a workforce with productivity and capacity for making income, which is six to seven percent less than what they would have if they had had a permanent education. And this comes from a very bad education system. In general, those countries with the best education indexes in Latin America, it is still bad. It is a bad system. It is a system that's not providing the skills that are necessary for people in the 21st century to have the capacities to generate and their own progress. And coming out of the poverty relies to a large extent on the capacity of people to have the opportunities uh, and that generation of uh, opportunities, the main opportunity generator is education. So I would like to insist on this. The dignity of Latin America to achieve that uh, progress, uh, the well-being needs to look at the economic issue. And in order to do this, it must not resolve uh, the issues around investment, macroeconomic situation, the stability or legal security for the people uh, to be able to invest and keep those periods of growth for longer, but also it requires having the population with their own knowledge and skills and with good human capital. And this is where we have a very complicated and difficult task and challenge. And we will need to prepare our teachers that better. We will need to assess them. We will need to support them so they can develop the uh, art. And this is not easy uh, with the... Um, teachers, uh, communities, and with the people who sometimes fail to understand the need to improve this system. We need the support and uh, skills and also the supervision and evaluation of the work in class so that people can develop their skills that will allow them to earn their lives in a better way. Thank you, Rodriguez. Ramon, you will now close this talk. I will mention some of the questions that we received. Uh, but um, in fact, we have answered some of these uh, questions. There are some uh, questions around the alignment between Russia and China and how that can have an impact on Latin America. Also with the influence that the US uh, has in the region and this in a context of uh, deceleration of the economy in the region and the political polarization uh, as a, one of the main causes of the lack of integration on the continent. These are issues that we have covered already, but Ramon, I will give you the floor and you may refer to these questions again and close our chat. Yes, to try and answer, well, Russia and China. Here the issue is with China. Russia belongs to Europe, basically. The discussion in Europe between the single market, the European Union, who were very deceived by the UK, I believe that this kind of regime needs to have a mat maturation pro uh, process. 
see that success will take some time and starts from smaller understandings. And I'm referring to Mercosur, as this is what I know best. We were better then that when we tried to deal with the whole continent. Maybe one day we will get to that, but that is not the case. So having the context of Russia in Europe, let's talk about China. China it has been mentioned several times, and I said it earlier. They are an extremely successful economy model with a capitalist model. It's a model that's capitalist, liberal, and privatization prone. The politically incorrect things are normally correct. And that China is a political dictatorship. It is a nation where there is no freedom of press, there are no individual freedoms. And I am concerned. Why? Well, because in our continent, we see results in favor of left-wing candidates. But fortunately, it is not always the case for the economy. And the typical case is Peru. Peru in 1990 started with the same model that we had back in the 90s here in Argentina with what we call the convertibility. The President Menes went further than President Fujimori, but we they had 72% of poor population and we started in the 90s with a poverty level of around after the inflation of in 1989, around 30%, but we quickly managed to bring it down to 15%. Today, we are at 46% of poverty and 52 in my province. So let's just round it up to 50%. Peru has 17% of poverty index, but from 72 back in the 90s to just in a few, in, in just a, a little bit more than 30 years, and with different left and right presidents, with the same policies, by the way, and currently with a president that comes from outside of the system, the economy is not going to be touched. And Chile maintained their economic model for more than 40 years, and I hope they will not change it for the worst. They might need to do some retouches for the better, as economy is dynamic. But what I'm trying to say is that the economic model that fell into demagogy and led to poverty, uh, they have nothing positive, except for the case of China, that are leading towards uh, a monolithic model, and they are pushing ahead with uh, economic liberties. Sometimes this is not very rational, because we sometimes have some somebody who managed to win an election process this is my concern, my biggest concern, because I don't think there is a, a less bad system on the planet. Oh, maybe this is the, the best possible uh, systems or model. Uh, China is showing something that's very um, attractive for many dictatorships. And if you look there, some people might think that we need to copy the communist dictatorship. But China did not do what the uh, dictators uh, do elsewhere in the world. They take the economy for their own good. The economy of the state, what for? Well, so you can name your own people and you can fill your pockets. This is a reality that I could see with my own eyes. So is privatizing popular? Yes, but if you do it right, it is also highly efficient. When Cavada privatized the electric sector in Argentina, we had power cuts of five hours. These were programmed. We used to buy energy even from Paraguay. We didn't mention this country, but this is a good economic model. So the issue of energy, by privatizing those companies, we managed to export energy to our neighboring countries. We did not have NAFTA towards the end of the 1980s. And you had to carry your own bottles at the time. This changed based and thanks to privatization. The electric privatization made Argentina's electric tariff, the lowest after Canada. We didn't win Canada, but we won the US. This, what I'm saying, is not said on the news, on the press. It is not interesting. And that's why I highly value meetings such as this with uh, such a high political level and prestige uh, as those of my colleagues. And I'd like to congratulate you, Lurival, 
because being in the strongest country in our region, you are giving us this opportunity and this voice. So my best greetings to all of you. Thank you. Ramon, you should be on television, really. Yes, it was such an incredible talk. It was very rich. Jamil Mawad from Cambridge, Massachusetts in the US. We had Federico Ramon Puerta from Apostles de las Misiones in Argentina, and Miguel Angel Rodriguez Echeverria directly from San Jose in Costa Rica. Thank you very much to all three of you for this session. And we'll now give the floor and we will welcome the president of the Policy Center for the South, Karim Elanawi, who is now going to close this uh, session of the Atlantic Dialogues. Karim, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, dear president. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, uh, to have you close the Atlantic Dialogues. We are very proud to have you. Uh, it's been, uh, uh, like always, very informative to listening to you. Uh, so thank you, really, many thanks for, for contributing again to the Atlantic Dialogues. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear audiences, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, let me also thank all the speakers close to 80 uh, that have contributed to the Atlantic Dialogues. Uh, let me thank also, of course, uh, the staff at the Atlantic Dialogue for uh, making this a, a great success, an online success, uh, and also, of course, to our audiences uh, to have followed us uh, online during uh, uh, more than, uh, than two months now. Uh, this was the 10th edition of the Atlantic Dialogue, like the 9th, it, on an online edition, um, with all uh, its benefits, but also its, uh, its uh, frustrations after, after two years of almost uh, online events. Uh, but uh, we are very proud and we are really thankful uh, to all of you to have uh, allowed us to keep our community alive. Uh, of course, it was not optimal. We would have liked to get together in Marrakech like we do every year around the 15th of December. But what has been achieved is really uh, keeping the community alive. And I really want to thank you again uh, for your commitment, for the time you spent to help us keep the, our community uh, to, together. This is a very special community, a community that gather uh, uh, countries from uh, the global south, from the new south in particular, which is, uh, of course, uh, dear to our hearts and to the, our missions at the Policy Center, and from uh, advanced economies. Uh, and at uh, sort of inter, uh, interconnection of civil society, policy making, and academia. Uh, and this is very special as we don't have many forums like the Atlantic Dialogue. Uh, uh, bringing together uh, this, uh, this very special community. It is also special because we have our Atlantic Dialogue Emerging Leader uh, community that joins also uh, this dialogue, making it both a, uh, a north-south dialogue, but also an intergenerational dialogue, bringing fresh perspective, uh, creative perspective to our, to our dialogues. And that's, that is... Uh, very, very special. We gather many insights from your discussions, from your uh, contribution uh, in uh, what to do to improve our health system, what are the challenges of multilateralism, uh, how uh, we here in the New South could uh, uh, contribute to a better global governance. Uh, again, also trade was an important uh, a topic in our discussions uh, and uh, climate and many other uh, things. So again, thanks for your your great uh, your great insight. Uh, I think there's uh, lots of value to this collective discussion and exchanges, and this is uh, 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 a value, a central value of the policy center for the New South. It's also a fundamental value of. Uh, uh, what Morocco stands for, a place where we can have open dialogue uh, with tolerance and mutual respect, uh, grounded on fact-based analysis, 
academia empirical work for improving uh, public policies, both for uh, at the global level, but with a, a, a narrower focus on, on, on Africa and uh, also, of course, for us uh, here at the think tank on, uh, uh, on Morocco. This will, uh, without any doubt, uh, irrigate our uh, research program for the coming, uh, for the coming years. Uh, and we, uh, we, we, continue, we will continue uh, to, uh, to work on this uh, community. We will continue uh, to, uh, to contribute to these dialogues and we hope to see you uh, very soon uh, at the end of, uh, of uh, next year in Marrakech and of course uh, very soon during the, the year there will be uh, I'm sure many opportunities where we will be able to uh, uh, to see uh, to see uh, to see each other uh, we also take from uh, these Atlantic dialogues that COVID has been uh, is not a short-term phenomena is more a, a it, uh, it hides also uh, profound structural transformation uh, for our economies, for our world, uh, and, uh, uh, and the many insights you gave were also, uh, uh, were also well noted here by the teams, and we will, uh, without a doubt, reach out to you to, uh, to continue our discussion. So again, let me thank you uh, for, for your contributions, and uh, uh, let, hoping to see you uh, very soon, uh, soon next year, and uh, let me also wish you a uh, a wonderful uh, 2022 uh, uh, year and for your your families your beloved and yourself many thanks again